It seems the mini PC craze of 2023 has continued right into the new year, with Aya Neo joining the fray. So what new ideas have they brought to the table? What separates this mini PC from others we've seen recently? Well, for starters, this thing is cute as hell. Today's video is brought to you by me. Check out craftcomputing.store for all of my official merch and help fund the content that you enjoy watching here on the channel. From custom laser engraved pint glasses to coasters and whiskey stones, and even our brand new double wall insulated coffee tumblers, all of my merch is designed 100% in-house and made to order by me. I'm also now offering flat rate international shipping to 23 different countries, and if you live in the continental US, free shipping on orders over $35. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to craftcomputing.store and start drinking like a pro. Cheers, everyone. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So this is the Ioneo Retro Mini PC AM01. And if you've been following the channel over the last year, you'd know that while I'm a huge fan of this form factor, it's the marketing of a lot of mini PCs that I've taken issue with for, let's just say, overselling the usability of this kind of hardware. Before we get into it, Ioneo did send out the AM1 for my review. Like all reviews on the channel, no money changed hands. Ioneo has no input over the production of this video, nor will they see the video before it goes live on YouTube. Now, the obvious selling point of the Ioneo Retro Mini PC is the looks. According to Ioneo, it combines a rich blend of retro gaming and tech culture elements, featuring an exquisite retro design with the playful smiley face from 1984, faithfully recreating the classic PC look. I don't know if Ioneo knows this or not, but the 1984 Macintosh wasn't the origin of modern PCs, rather a competitor to the PC that we know today. But setting aside the IBM versus Apple debate, the looks of the AM01 are superb. From the classic Mac smiley face to the replaceable rainbow insignia to the power button looking like a floppy drive eject button, it's definitely a nice bit of nostalgia surrounding a good bit of modern hardware. As far as what's inside the AM01, there are two different CPU options to choose from. Starting at $199, you can snag the Ryzen 3200 4U 8-threaded CPU with Vega 3 onboard graphics. With that model, you'll get 8GB of DDR4, along with a 256GB NVMe drive for storage, and preloaded with Windows 11 Home. Honestly, for a basic PC with the ability to play indie games, Minecraft, or work as a fantastic emulation system, it's definitely not a bad starting price. For $320, you can step up to a much more modern CPU in the Ryzen 5700U, and a significantly more powerful APU with Vega 8 graphics on board, along with the same 8GB and 256 gigs of storage. What we've got here is the 5700U model, but kitted out with 16 gigs of DDR4-3200 memory and a 512 gig NVMe drive, which is priced at $359. Probably the best deal that's out there though is for $259, you can opt for the barebone model with a Ryzen 5700U on board and install your own memory and storage. Taking a quick walk around the system, we've got a USB-C port up front with Gen 3x2 speeds, a pair of USB 2.0 and 3.2 Gen 2 ports around the rear, gigabit ethernet, a DC power jack, a single 3.5mm headphone jack for audio, and HDMI 2.0 and DisplayPort 1.4 for video output. One very nice thing about including a display port is it means analog video is still possible without the need of an active adapter, as display port to VGA is all you need to connect this to an old CRT monitor for that true retro experience. Jumping back inside the unit itself, there's support for a single M.2 NVMe drive, a pair of SODIMM memory slots for dual channel DDR4, and an included bracket and cables to add in a 2.5 inch disc for extra storage. However, getting any of that installed is a bit of a pain. See, the motherboard is set up in such a way that it needs to be removed from the case to install any of those parts. And unfortunately, the heatsink and fan also need to be removed in order to access all of the screws holding the motherboard down. While it's a pretty straightforward operation, you will need to reapply thermal paste each time you need to swap out the hard drive or the memory. As I have a plan for the system that needs at least one terabyte of storage, I did opt to add in a one terabyte SSD, and the process took me around 20 minutes to do. It's not overly difficult, but it's probably not something that someone with no PC building experience would be comfortable with. Keep that in mind, especially if you opt for the bare bones option, as there's no avoiding a full teardown when you go to install your memory and your SSD. 
Now I've reviewed a number of mini PCs over the last couple years, and one of my key complaints has always been around the marketing of those PCs. They often tout them as go anywhere, do anything, portable, triple A gaming machines, as if they weren't just a 35 watt APU in a small package. AAA gaming is also always a bit out of reach, especially for some of the more budget-oriented mini PCs still rocking AMD's 5000 APUs inside. Does that sound familiar? Gaming handhelds have been opting for much more powerful options over the last couple years, in either the AMD 6800U with RDNA 2 graphics, or the more recent Zen 4-powered 7840U with a full 12 compute units of RDNA 3 in the Radeon 780M. Those systems are fully capable of playing modern AAA games at upwards of 1080p and 45 to 60 frames per second, but only at low and sometimes medium settings. That's an acceptable trade-off when you're locked to a 7-inch screen, but those settings don't hold up nearly as well when you plug into a 24-inch monitor. And while the iNeo AM01 with the Ryzen 5700U is faster than a Steam Deck, the Steam Deck is designed for 720p gaming. I looked at some questionable marketing from mini PCs last year, heavily promoting Cyberpunk 2077 and other demanding games as playable, only to be met with 20 frame per second performance. Most of Ioneo's marketing does seem to revolve around the Retro Mini being a general purpose PC, and I don't mind that angle at all. In fact, it specifically mentions retro gaming as one of the main use cases, and it's hard to argue against that. Emulation up to and including PlayStation 3 will do quite well on this level of hardware. And if you're looking for a dedicated system for emulation, you can do a lot worse than a 5700U. Even the 3200U system at $199 would be a great match for PlayStation 2, GameCube, and lower, and be far and away better than building something like a RetroPie from a Raspberry Pi 5. It might actually end up costing less than a Raspberry Pi based solution as well, considering a Raspberry Pi 5 8GB will run $80 by itself, and that's before adding storage, a case, a heatsink and fan, and a suitable power supply. Ioneo does have some gaming references in their current marketing materials for the AM01, with screenshots of Dark Souls 3, Dirt 5, GTA 5, Street Fighter 6, and a couple others. I like showing those titles, as they'd all likely run well on the 5700U, at least at 1080p and either low or medium settings. But as much as a fan as I am for retro consoles, the Apple 1984 vibe doesn't hold a lot of nostalgia for me, nor does it make me think, I should load this up with Super Nintendo and Nintendo 64 ROMs. It's modeled after a retro PC, so why don't we see how it performs as a retro PC? See, we've all seen the consoles like the NES and SNES Classic, but we've obviously never received a PC Classic Mini. Let's change that. There are a couple of projects I've had my eye on for a while now, but I wasn't quite sure how well they would do in a dedicated video on this channel. I figured though, rather than just reviewing the same Zen 2 based APU hardware I've looked at so many times before, it might be fun to see how a retro mini classic would run old DOS and Windows games through a project called ExoDOS. If you're into retro PC gaming, you're likely already familiar with DOSBox, a DOS emulator that at this point has near perfect compatibility with games and applications from the DOS era, even running Windows 3.1 with relative ease. However, DOSBox often requires a number of tweaks to get specific games running. Games developed for the 286 era, for example, often tied their game speed directly to CPU cycles. Games like Wing Commander would run two to three times faster than intended, even on 386 era hardware, let alone when paired with a modern CPU. DOSBox can be configured to cap CPU speeds for older games, allowing them to run at speeds they were actually designed to run at. But you don't want to apply that CPU setting universally in DOSBox, as newer games obviously have higher CPU requirements. There's also a pesky problem with proprietary hardware. While DOSBox supports a wide range of sound hardware, like Sound Blaster or Gravis Ultrasound, <sighs> reset the clock. There's also the pesky problem with proprietary hardware. While DOSBox supports a wide range of sound hardware, like Sound Blasters and Gravis Ultrasound, early 3D accelerators like 3DFX are not supported at all. That is, until the community came together and reverse engineered a solution. The DOSBox Community Edition features full 3DFX support, so games like Descent 2 and Tomb Raider are now playable with full 3D acceleration, not just software rendering. So that's great, but where does the ExoDOS project come into all this? 
Well, ExoDOS is a collection of games and software for DOS, but with pre-configured recipes for DOSBox compatibility and all wrapped up in a unified launcher with full box art and manuals. To play the game you want, just select it inside of LaunchBox and hit go. There are two different downloads to choose from depending on what you're wanting to play. There's a light version that's just five gigabytes in size, allowing you to download games you want to play on demand. Or if you want everything to be installed offline and ready to launch, you can download the full repository. But be warned, once it's unpacked, it took a full 1.15 terabytes of space, which means even though I added a one terabyte SATA SSD to this thing, I was out of space midway through it uncompressing and had to take the retro mini PC back apart and replace that with a two terabyte drive. Don't worry, I hear that's a fairly straightforward process. Once installed, you'll see the ExoDOS icon on your desktop. Open that up and you'll have access to over 2,600 titles, all pre-configured for 100% compatibility using various versions of DOSBox, DOSBox Community Edition, Scum VM for LucasArts Adventure titles, and a variety of other emulators and source ports. I myself never actually owned a 3DFX card and didn't get to experience many of the games from that era that allowed for hardware acceleration. Games like Descent 2, Blood, Jet Fighter 3, Shadow Warrior, I played all of them back in the day, but only through software rendering. Getting to experience them in full 3D has been a heck of a lot of fun this week. Performance-wise, none of the games that I tried actually stressed the 5700U in any meaningful way, even games that were emulating 3DFX acceleration. Descent 2 and Tomb Raider both played like a dream, easily holding 60fps with full 3D rendering. The Elder Scrolls Redguard had some jittering at first, but just lowering my CPU cycles by two clicks managed to sync everything up just fine. While DOS gaming has been possible for quite a few years, with some very impressive accuracy, early Windows gaming has been a little less forgiving. See, while DOS emulation is fairly mature, there's been little community effort up until recently to bring Windows compatibility up to the same level. See, outside of the retro gaming community, there's an assumption that if a program was written for Windows, you can just install it on a newer version of Windows and everything will work just fine. In reality, any games written for Windows 3.1 through Windows Millennium have a near zero chance of running in a modern operating system, especially for Windows 3.1 through Windows 98, as modern 64-bit versions of Windows are no longer able to run 16-bit code written for those old versions. Hardware compatibility was a bit hit or miss in those days as well, with no real standard API used for game development. With that in mind, the ExoDOS team has been working on a Windows game list as well, with ExoWin 3X now on version 2, and bringing the same ease of use to fans of early Windows games. It comes in quite a bit smaller packaging at just 375 gigabytes, but it also has only a fraction as many games. There are games in this list I forgot that I'd forgotten about them. There's Earth Siege 2, a mech simulator along the lines of Mech Warrior, but with flying vehicles. There's Fury 3 and F Zone, the spiritual successors to Terminal Velocity that were Windows only releases. Windows versions of The Incredible Machine, which have higher resolution graphics than their DOS counterparts. How about some After Dark screensavers with flying toasters? There's the Sierra classic Johnny Castaway screensaver. And speaking of Sierra, King's Quest 5, 6, and 7 had Windows versions with enhanced graphics over their DOS cousins. One of my favorite all-time Windows games is also here with Operation Innerspace, a super unique game and one that's really not possible to recreate with any thought towards security today, as it used your hard drive and file system as the environment, navigating through Innerspace to collect icons and applications, ridding your files of viruses, all while upgrading your tiny ship, fighting pirates, taking part in races, and more. The game environment is constantly evolving because the files on your PC are always changing. Installing a new application means you have endless new directories to explore. I can't tell you how many hundreds of hours I probably sunk into this game as a kid, and now I can do it again, albeit in a slightly smaller sandbox. In all, there are around 1100 Windows 3.1 games here, many of which I haven't seen since I was playing them on the hardware that I bought them for in the 90s. I'm a huge proponent of software and game preservation, and seeing projects like Exodos striving to keep not only records of games, but make them playable on modern hardware is something that makes me incredibly happy. So why did I set up the Ion Neo Retro Mini PC as a dedicated retro PC, when all I really needed was a two terabyte hard drive? 
Well, nostalgia is really as much about aesthetics as it is about software or performance. And as I said, the 5700GU had absolutely no trouble running any game that I tried in the ExoDOS or ExoWin collections. I'm hopeful as other retro projects like PCEM gain better and better compatibility with both DOS and Windows, especially including Windows 95 through Windows 98, we'll see more efforts like what ExoDOS is doing, making retro gaming accessible on modern computers and making it as simple as possible for everyone to try. Getting back to the Ion Neo Retro Mini, I'm not sure I would have gone with the 1984 Macintosh as a spiritual predecessor to represent the retro PC, but I can't argue with how good it looks either. Disassembly was a bit trickier than I'd like to see, and I feel like there should have been a way to add a 2.5-inch drive without removing both the board and the heatsink, as that creeps into territory beyond what most people are going to be comfortable dealing with. But overall, I like the performance that's on offer here with the Ryzen 5700U. For $360, you can get this exact model with the Ryzen 5700 equipped with 16 gigabytes of DDR4 3200 and 512 gigs of NVMe. While it's not going to play Cyberpunk, I did try out GTA 5 as that was one of the games that were on their AAA list, and it got well over 60 frames per second, even at 1080p and high settings. That's not going to be true of the 3200U model though, so don't get your hopes up too high for that $199 unit. That being said, the price points on the Retro Mini are slightly better than other Mini PCs that I've reviewed on the channel in the last year. And Ioneo's marketing didn't go crazy on the carry your Mini PC anywhere while conveniently forgetting that a monitor and keyboard are required to go with it. They also don't exaggerate gaming performance, with some slightly older AAA games being referenced that are actually playable on this hardware. If you're interested in downloading either ExoDOS or ExoWin, I will have links to their websites down in the video description. The same goes for the awesome looking Ion Neo Retro Mini PC. Links on where to buy that will also be down in the usual place. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is down in the video description and will get you exclusive access to my Discord server. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Need to wash my desk now. Beer for today is from Athletic Brewing Company, the non-alcoholic beer company out of San Diego, California. It's the Mangonada IPA. Uh, obviously, less than 0.5%. Well, I might as well review what's left of this beer. I really like what Athletic Brewing does. Uh, basically, there's no reason you can't make a non-alcoholic craft beer. It's just whenever anyone tries to make an alcoholic beer, they're usually trying to do it as cheap as possible to compete with soda. Why not compete with craft beer? <laughs> and uh, it turns out you can actually turn out some very fantastic products. This is the Mango Nada. There's really no mango in here. Uh, this is a genuinely full-bodied beer, uh, which is something that Athletic does quite well more often than not. It doesn't have any mango in it. What it does have is maybe a little bit of like a melon rind, kind of midway through the flavor. It's not a bad flavor. It's just not overly refreshing, nor is it big bodied enough where I want this with a meal. It's kind of this halfway in between. I can't say that I love it, but I think this is a really solid offering. And if you're looking for a medium bodied beverage that doesn't have any ABV, you can do a lot worse than this.